Hey Star Trek fans, welcome to another edition of the Disco Deep Dive, where I take a look at the Easter eggs, canon connections, and continuity bits in an episode of Star Trek Discovery. This episode is all about Unification 3, the sequel that was many, many years in the making. I'm Dan Gunther, let's get right down to it and find out what was in this particular episode of Star Trek Discovery that links to prior canon. The title of this episode is Unification 3, and it is really a spiritual successor to the first two episodes, Unification 1 and Unification 2, as seen in Season 5 of Star Trek The Next Generation. In those episodes, we see Ambassador Spock embarking on a mission to bring the planets of Vulcan and Romulus together. In the course of this episode, many centuries later, we see that his dream has been fulfilled. It's fitting that this episode was written by Kirsten Beyer, thought to be the keeper of the canon on the writing staff of Star Trek Discovery, and it really shows that there is a deep love for the canon of Star Trek as evidenced through this episode. When Tilly and Burnham are discussing the implications of the data they've learned from the black boxes that Burnham has collected, three different ships are named. The first one, the USS Yelchin, is an homage to actor Anton Yelchin, who played Pavel Chekhov in the three Kelvin timeline films Star Trek, Star Trek Into Darkness, and Star Trek Beyond. Yelchin was tragically lost at a very young age in 2016, and it was nice to see the creators of Discovery honor him in this manner. The second ship mentioned is the Gavnor. This is not explicitly called out as a Federation ship, and in fact the name is very similar to a Cardassian freighter seen in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, the Boknor. This is not enough to extrapolate that this is definitely a ship of Cardassian origin, but the similarities are notable. And finally, the starship Giacconi is also mentioned. It was named for an astrophysicist, Riccardo Giacconi, who is known for laying down the foundations of X-ray astronomy. In this episode, the Discovery and her crew journey to the planet Navarre. Navarre went by a different name in previous Star Treks, namely Vulcan. The name Navarre has a really interesting origin and really speaks to the amount of research done by the writing team of Star Trek Discovery. The term Navarre was coined by Dorothy Jones in a Star Trek fanzine from the 1960s called Spockinalia. The name literally means to form and is meant to describe the comparing and contrasting of two things or two aspects of one thing, which makes this a truly fitting choice for the name of a planet wherein the Romulans and Vulcans have been reunified into a single population. This is the perfect illustration of the realization of Spock's dream of reunification as seen in the episodes Unification 1 and 2 in Season 5 of Star Trek The Next Generation. Speaking of Spock, we do get some lovely footage of Leonard Nimoy playing Spock from the aforementioned Unification 2. Michael Burnham is reviewing the recording from the personal files of Admiral Jean-Luc Picard, the captain, of course, from Star Trek The Next Generation and most recently seen in the series Star Trek Picard. The footage itself would seem to be captured from Picard's discussions with Spock on Romulus. It's not exactly clear how he got this footage, but given the future technology, it's very easy to imagine how this could be recreated with holograms, Picard's testimony, or perhaps some sort of recording using a computer communications device or a tricorder. And as I've mentioned in other videos and podcasts, it's definitely not the first time we've seen Starfleet personnel reviewing footage, the provenance of which would seem to be somewhat suspect. I'm thinking, of course, of the Federation Council watching parts of Star Trek III The Search for Spock at the beginning of Star Trek IV. In Star Trek 3, we also get some very detailed recordings from the engine room using some really great camera angles and dynamic shots, and uh, yeah, I'm sure security footage looks exactly like this. One could also bring up Riker reviewing the Enterprise's encounter with Q in the TNG pilot episode Encounter at Farpoint. The combined Romulan-Vulcan planet of Navarre has a unique insignia worn by all of the representatives who come from the planet to Discovery, 
And if you look closely, this emblem is a mesh of the Romulan Bird of Prey symbol that we're used to from Star Trek The Next Generation onwards, and the Vulcan Idic symbol first introduced in the TOS episode, Is There in Truth No Beauty? Truly a beautiful and fitting symbol of the unification of these two peoples. We get several shots of the planet Navarre, again formerly Vulcan, in which it appears there may be a moon orbiting the planet. That's no moon. This in fact is not a moon, but the long-established sister planet of Vulcan, namely Tukut, seen in Star Trek The Motion Picture and other times throughout Star Trek, as well as mentioned by name and described in Star Trek novels. In one particular novel, playing on Spock's line from the man trap that Vulcan has no moon, the line, Vulcan has no moon, it has a nightmare, can be found. This episode also reintroduces us to Gabrielle Burnham, Michael Burnham's biological mother, who has joined the Coat Milot, an order of Romulan warrior nuns, first seen in the Star Trek Picard episode Absolute Candor. The Coat Milot believe in the philosophy of Absolute Candor, which requires them to tell the truth at all times. Gabrielle Burnham was last seen in Discovery's second season, in which she disappeared off the planet Esau 4 into a wormhole, presumably returning to the future on the planet Terralisium. We discover in this episode that she did not arrive at Terralisium, but instead appeared in the 32nd century version of Esau 4, traveling through time, but not space. Other than, of course, the great distance that Esau 4 would be from its original position 930 years apart, but we won't get into that right now. And finally, at the very end of the episode, we see Discovery departing the planet Navarre. In the deep background, we see a nebula. This is, in fact, a real nebula, M42, also known as the Great Nebula in Orion. Over on the Positively Trek discussion group on Facebook, member Tristan Schwartz pointed this fact out, including a couple of gorgeous photos of the nebula taken from his own backyard observatory, which he posted in the group. If you'd like to take part in great discussions about Star Trek stuff, including our podcast Positively Trek, but other topics as well, please join the Positively Trek discussion group. I'll have a link in the description below. It's a lot of fun and we're always looking for new members. And if you're wanting to discuss Star Trek topics in a positive manner and in a place with some like-minded fans who always have really interesting things to say, please join us. We'd love to have you. Well, those were all of the Easter eggs and canon connections that I found for Unification 3. Were there any that I missed? Please let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks, as always, to the Patreon supporters for their help in bringing these episodes to you. I really could not do it without you. Thank you so very much. To everyone else, I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much again for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, wear a mask, keep six feet apart, and let's all get through this together. Live long and prosper.